Greetings from Podcastville. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Onnit. For all your supplemental needs, Onnit is there, whether it's Alpha Brain, Shroom Tech Sport, or Shroom Tech Immune. Unless I live off that fucking immune shit when I fly. You know how it is. You don't want to get germs from people. You scratch your fucking ass, you sniff your finger, next thing you know you got the fucking flu. Anyway, go to fucking Onnit. Take a look at all the supplements they have. I don't deal with the metal. I can't help you with the metal, nothing like that. But the elk sausage, all that type of stuff, delicious. To supplement, go to onnit.com and press in. Church, C-H-U-R-C-H, and get 10% off delivered to your house. I know you're starting jujitsu. You, I get emails every day. Thank you for Listen, you want a tough, dependable gi? You want to help me out? Go to fujisports.com right now. They got the all-purpose light gi, $96. I'm going to give you 10% off. Or go full fucking blast with the Superito or the Sakai S. E-K-I, the 2.0, they're not fucking around. You need shin guards, you need a mouthpiece, you need fucking uh, uh, portable uh, kettlebells, like that, that they're weightless kettlebells. You can travel with them. Fujisports.com is where to go. They got tips on dieting. They got everything. Go to Fujisports.com right now and press in. Church. And get 10% off your next order delivered to your house. You're helping out the church. Take this fucking mule. It's a beautiful day to be alive, Monday. And we have... Uh, Somebody in studio that I, I can't even describe how excited I am, and uh, Mr. Henry Rollins. What's happening, beautiful? Yeah, it's good to be here. It's great to have you here. Thanks. You know, I was telling Heidi, the brain supreme behind the scenes, yeah. that uh, Winston Churchill once said, success is moving from area to area with great enthusiasm. Huh. And you are the fucking living embodiment of that. Thank you. You don't get bored at anything. My number one question for you before we even, how the fuck do you go from Berlin in 83, getting hit in the head with a fucking bottle and being the nicest guy in the world? I mean about it. I get hit in the head in the bottle, first of all, I'm doing karate kicks, I'm bitch. You're, you're asking them why they did this to you, that you had never done anything to them before, which was just a beautiful composure to have as a young man. It's a good age. shot, that guy. That guy hit it's you. It's a great shot. And now, 12 years later, because this is what I go through, you're on a set. Now, 11 years later, you're on a set opposite Buffalo Bill, Bill Buckingham, or whatever the fuck the guy's name is. He, because he's from Buffalo, New York. I did a little longest yard right. with him. I used to torment him. And Robert De Niro. And you're sitting there in a trailer, and you're looking at De Niro going, 12 years ago, I was in Germany getting hit in the head with a fucking bottle. <laughs> and today, I'm drinking pomegranate juice. You know. Well, the, I come from the minimum wage working world of the late 1970s. I, I graduated high school in 79 and went right into the longer version of summer jobs, which I always had. But this was like 40 hours, 50 hours, for, you know, for keeps. And I just figured the rest of my life was going to be jobs like this because I, no, I had no direction. I didn't want to be like a sailor, a spaceman, a banker. I just, I'll just work these jobs that are hard on the feet live on top ramen noodles and live in an apartment with my roommate that smelled of our, our laundry because he was, he was working too. And so I'd work nights, he'd work days. We kind of see each other passing by. And um, Black Flag was uh, pals of mine. And I, I they needed a singer and they said, yeah, you're pretty crazy. You want to audition? And I looked at, I was 20. And I Black at, Flag's out here. And yeah, you're, you're but, living, they, but they were on tour. And you're living? In D.C., in Washington. DC, okay. Yeah, and they were on tour. I kind of knew them from like months before they came through. DC and and uh, they said you're you're pretty crazy. You want to audition? I'm like that's my favorite band. And I looked at my life like well, there's a probably a job like this tomorrow if I quit this one, you know, three seventy five an hour. And so I auditioned, and they said okay you're in. And suddenly everything was different. I said so what do I do? They go you quit your job, you pack a bag, you give all your stuff away, and here's a tour itinerary. Meet us as soon as you can. And within several days, I was on a Greyhound bus from D.C. to Detroit. I still have the bus ticket. Met, you know, I quit my job, given away all my stuff, gave my records to my best friend and said, hold on to these in case I ever come back here. I had no idea what was going to happen next. And within two weeks, I'm living in a punk rock squat here in Hollywood because we didn't have a place to stay. And so I, I kind of come from I'll try anything. Because I'm not supposed to be in a movie or a TV show or on a stage. So anything. I'm supposed to be with an apron on putting extra fries with your shake. And so I just say yes to stuff. And I'm 57. 
And to this day, it's all still kind of surprising to me. Like, hey, you want to be in this? I'm like, yeah, huh. <laughs> just go do it. But I'm not ever telling you I'm an actor. I'm in this. I'm, that. I'm just like, I'm showing up and saying yes, because it'll probably all end next week. You got to always figure. And that's kind of my story is like, yeah, I'll try that because I have nothing to lose. Nothing. You are like... I don't know. I, 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 the first time Just I heard lucky, of you was basically. in Boulder. No, and that's the way I look at my life. Yeah. I look at you. First time I heard of you was in Boulder with Music Wise. Uh, a friend of mine, a Snoopy, a girl, turned me on to Black Flag. She also turned me on to the first Biggie Smalls album. Hmm. Just to let you know the, the contrast. Eclectic. In her, her fucking world. And, you know, I'm like, this is punk rock from the fucking century. She's like, yeah, asshole. What do you think it is? And then... The second gentleman to introduce me to you was Mr. Doug Stanhope. When I was out here in 1997, he was going to watch you somewhere, something, something you were doing. And I go, who the fuck is Henry Rollins? And he put you on, you know, the, the thing. I think he had an album. I don't know what the fuck it was. And you spoke, you said something that, whatever you were talking about, something about music and the connection. Hmm. <clears throat> you and I have, uh, I'm not a tough guy. You know, I, I come across like a tough guy, but I'm a sweetheart. I'm a pussycat, and I, I fear everything. And I came from another country. And what made the bridge for me complete, television opened up my eyes, but the bridge was the fucking music. Hmm. You know, uh, you you made a statement that your records never picked on you. Your albums never made fun of you. Yeah, your the Semper Fi. Never, yeah, that's yeah, your record collection is Semper Fi. It never abandons you. Your yeah. friends, they come and go. Sometimes you have to sue them. You know, there's that. But your records, they always stand straight at attention, waiting for you to deploy. And they don't care if you play them over and over. And if you take good care of them, they'll take good care of you. In fact, you can be kind of abusive to them. And they'll still kind of hang in there. So You said that, and it just destroyed my insides because... I think that's one thing that has been taken away from the American child today. The ability to save six bucks from their fucking yep. paper route and walk two miles to an album store to buy the latest Skip Jethro the bus, album. skip lunch, buy the skip record. Skip lunch. Yeah, I and did you, that. And you cannot wait to get home and put the album on without drugs. This is way, but no drugs, no. And just read the lyrics. And the, thank you to the Sheraton for providing us... You know, if you read the old Van Halen albums, right. I would always thank the Sheratons. And that's been taken away from us. That's an experience that... Yeah, it's one of the downsides of streaming and digital. I mean, for me, there's upsides to any advent in any technology that I deal with, which is audio for sure. So online music and streaming allows you to be curious and not have to buy the record. Like, I want to hear Charlie Parker. So you can go online and listen to some great sides of Charlie Parker. And you're like, that's my new favorite musician and go get the record. Or like, not for me, but you didn't spend 30 bucks buying a record you, you can't use. And so I like that. But rarely does your internet curiosity lead to a purchase. And so I like it when you hear some young band, you like them, go buy the record. That band's in a van starving right now. Like, buy two copies. And when, when they come to town, go to the show. And that's how going to the record store was for me growing up. You'd buy the record and you'd see a flyer. That band's coming to town. Of course you're going to go. And I did a lot of, well, it's going to be a three-mile through the snow walk home. Or I can get um, the, the second Van Halen record, which was like, that was kind of how I got that record. It's five, five bucks in those days. It was 1888 when I bought that record. But like, you know, you look at your money, like, okay. And you just walk through the snow and you get home freezing with that record. And it was never not worth it. And I, the fact that you can destroy them pretty easily, if you don't take good care of them, you wreck them. And it gave me responsibility. The first thing I ever valued as a kid, like, I'm not going to screw this up with my records. Everything else, skateboards, bikes, I would just wreck them because you play hard. But my records, especially with punk rock, when like it's like seven dollars for this single because it's from England, and that was like a third of a day's pay to get that to hear two minutes of angry music. And I, I treated that thing like a Ming vase. And I've had some of these records about 40 years, and they kind of look like the day I got them because I valued that. And I think a lot of that goes away when you can have a, a streaming account. Because just music just becomes this thing that comes out of your phone, and it's not what uh, Robert Plant wanted you to hear when he made that record. He didn't want you to hear an MP3 through your phone, through the the headphones that came with your phone. See, that's what I love about you that you have respect for the artist, something yeah. that has been lost somewhere along the line. Like I'm the same way, 
you know, Robert Plant did not want this yeah. album. Hey, well, I'm the same way. It's an older idea. It's an older value set, basically. Where, you know, you and I would hike to the record store and you'd sit in there and get burned by the snarky guy behind the counter. Like, what's that record? Well, if you knew anything, like, dude, just sell me something good. I would get like harshed out by these record store guys. They eventually liked me because I'd hang out so long and ask so many questions. They saw that I was a true record fanatic and they were begrudgingly were nice to me. But um, a lot of that is gone. And the, the mecca of the record store where you'd walk in and there's always like those three guys with no lives hanging around by the counter, commenting on what everybody's buying. <laughs> Like, well, you know, he was better in 76. So I'm like, just, <laughs> and as an older guy, I am, I don't do that at record stores, but I am one of those guys. I am one of those guys. I really also. have to like bite my tongue. Yeah, go, you Not have that to. record, the other one. Why are you getting that? That sucked. That, yeah. Everybody knows that he left the band before yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. He was, he was having personal issues. But, and the guy's looking at you like, who gives a fuck if he had personal? I'm yeah. telling you, now I'm letting, I do this. I go to Atomic. Oh, it's a great store. Right here, a little atomic, really great which I really like the no, guy. I bought a lot of records from them. Great people. Went, and you know, and you can go to, again, I love Amoeba. Yep. On Sunset Boulevard. I go almost every Friday when I can. Do you really? Yeah. And what do you drop there? Like, I don't mean to pry into your business. The last time I was yeah, you there. Always, they always get you. The last time I was there, I did $326. <laughs> Just they, because you... You got to have those records. You got to have those records. Yeah, I did 800 in cash the other day in Melbourne, Australia. It said 800 Australian, so it's more like 600 American. But I didn't hesitate. I had to have those records. That's what, When I spend money, you can tell by the way I dress. I'm not spending a lot of money on clothes. I drive a Mazda 6. When I spend money, it's mainly records. Why you're very, in anything I've watched about you, you carry that fucking work ethic of yours like a fucking torch. Yeah. Like most people, you know, they talk to you about being a Jehovah Witness. Like if I let you, you would knock on people's doors and tell them the importance of getting your hands dirty. You, did you have a paper route? Yeah. So oh, first, Jesus Christ. First almighty. job I ever had. Paper route. So My you, introduction to the pyramid scheme of like, yeah. you'll throw 80 million papers and somehow you'll get 40 bucks. Like, how'd that happen? That's how I got my first bike saved up for my Schwinn bike. I looked at it in the Sears catalog. Maybe it was the Se a Sears bike. It was green. And I'd look at it every day in that big catalog you get in the mail. And finally I had the money. I took the bus up Wisconsin Avenue to the Sears, bought the bike. It looked just like in the picture. And I rode it home. And it got stolen a day later. <laughs> <laughs> but I bought it by throwing the Washington Star, and Dan Rather was one of my customers. That's right. You're a DC guy. Yeah, That's right. I, I put a new. I, I knew his son too. Is my age, Dan Jr. But um, I, I used to put a paper on on the great Dan Rather's porch. Hey, you carry that. Uh, my next album CD is going to be called Immigrant Mentality. You know, I've been talking to Rogan about it a lot because it's when I finally started having a little success is because I threw my immigrant mentality in there. I got to tell you something. Have you done a DNA test? No. Yeah, I did. It, was there a Mexican or a Puerto Rican in your family or a Cuban? Because you have Spanish work <laughs> ethic. Like, you know, you were telling one story that you'd, on the weekends, you'd work 40 hours. You were in school and you'd have keys to open up businesses. Because yeah. By the time I was a sophomore in high school, I had the keys to like a few businesses. Like they gave me big responsibility because they knew I'm not going to steal. No way. And I could do the inventory. I could do the cash. I could make the deposit. And so I was not great in school, but I had like adult responsibility that I really valued. I didn't care about school. I didn't like it. But on, I'd work like three or four days a week after school. And then on the weekends, I'd work nine to five at a pet shop, run home, shower, jam down the street and be an usher from six to midnight at a movie theater. And then on Sundays, I'd work a day at a surf shop selling skateboards and repairing stuff. And then Monday morning, bright and early, back to school. And then on the summer, I would like triple up on all those jobs and just work kind of like seven days a week. So I liked earning my own money. I liked the autonomy of that. I mean, I didn't spend it much, but I liked earning it. It was not about like I have more money than you. It was about I am making my way in the world. And this has got to be preparation because I just figured when I get out of high school, it's going to be really hard for me. I'm going to have to be really tough and just learn about what a, a big work week is like. Because I just figured I'm an idiot and I'm not, going to, like, I'm not going to go to college and survive. I'm not going to go into the military. I'm not going to have a bank job. I'm not going to be, the straight world is going to be really hard to me. It's going to be tough. And so I'm going to have to get ready for that. And luckily, both my parents 
they're extraordinarily hardworking people. Like they're brutal. Like my dad is like scorched earth. He'd work all night, take a bus back to his place, shower, shave, new Brooks Brothers suit, go back to the office. And my mom worked for the government. So she was overworked and underappreciated for her entire career. And I'd go to visit him on the weekends, Monday through Friday with my mom, Saturday and Sunday with the dad. And all of them all weekend, they're just reading briefs, both of them. I mean, their weekend was getting ready for Monday. And I just got a lot from that was like, you just work all the time. And you never had to tell me twice to get a job. I never had an allowance. I didn't want it. I liked my own money. The guy has the cool pants from The Gap, like those painter's pants you like in the 70s. I'll buy a pair. I'll be cool like the kids. Buy my own skateboards. I just dug my own money. I didn't want an allowance. And I, I find, you know, I break leaves, whatever it took. I just like being kind of in the adult world uh, around adults, like seeing how money gets made, seeing how like things get ordered. I worked in an ice cream store. I learned about inventory and how to make the thing move better. I made the guy more money because I had the place set up for high volume sales, keep get the line out quicker. And I just enjoyed all of that. Now, you are 57. You, you said it thousands of times you're not interested in getting married or no. children. If you were to have children, will you instill the same values and principles of work ethic that you have, regardless of money or whatever? How would you raise that child? Carefully. Because um, my parents were very hard-driven people, and I don't know if a kid was really in their plans. They're kind of like, oh, no. So what do we do with this one? I mean, they, they weren't awful people. I'm just saying they were like, oh, kid, okay. Uh, so uh, what do you, what do people like you like? Oh, we like SpaghettiOs and the Smithsonian. I mean, they're so busy. And so if I was a parent, I would not want to raise my kid like that. I'd be more like my old friends from D.C. who grew up and have kids now. They're really there for that kid. Like we're doing the thing on Saturday and then we got this and he has the homework. We're going to go through it. And I'm like, wow, you're really being responsible. And so if I had a kid... I would have to radically change my life because I would see it as my duty. I'm not going to go on tour. I'm not going to do like, I, I do like 14 month long tours, come back for now and then. But I'm not going to be talking on a tour bus to my kid after a show. Go like, where's dad? Oh, dad's in Buffalo. Well, no, screw that. Dad should be with the kid. And that's just how I see it. And so I would, and I don't want to change how I live. So I wouldn't go on that venture unless I was willing to just radically change my life to not be a bad dad because kids they don't no kid is asked to get born they kind of come out and go like dude hook me up with a life here Look, i knocked my wife up at 49 i had no idea they told me if you smoke pot you got no sperm <laughs> spells i smoke pot with three hands she comes in the office one day and says you knocked me up this was not in my plan I had a child when I was young. I failed as a father. The wife won't talk to me. The kid won't talk to me. I ended up paid my child support. I did my legal obligations. Right. It just didn't work out because of my career. I wasn't ready for it. I had to pick one. Today, I only work on the road six days a month. You know, I leave here at four and take it to karate. And she's five. She just lost the second tooth when I was on the phone <laughs> with you last night. And yeah, she kept saying, tell him. Dead. She kept saying, tell him, tell <laughs> that guy that I lost my other tooth. I didn't want to tell her it was Lee because then she would have said, but I feel like it's my obligation. But I'm also at five. I instill that work ethic. Yeah. I, mean, I think I, it's very important. I, I would worry if I was a parent that I would clobber the child over the head with my values. I think as a parent, maybe you find your way because everyone's a rookie when they first have a kid and you're like, how, what do we do? But I would want to be careful that I wouldn't be too much. Like, here's how you got to be. Like, that's not no, you. No, I don't know. It's not. You know, I would just be afraid of being too, like, here's how you're going to live your life. 20 years ago, I would have been that dad. Yeah. Today, after seeing what I've seen, uh, I... I'm very open with her. I talk with her. She's five. I speak to her on the way out. I have to go to work. I love you. I had a meeting at nine, so I couldn't drive to school. I, I can't and I tell her, behave for your teachers and keep your eyes open. You know, and, you know, the same with the shit my mom said to me. Keep your eyes open. Don't let nobody mess with you today. You know, there's a scene uh, when you're A.J. Weston and Sons of Anarchy at huh. the end and, uh, you bend over to your son and you go, uh, go outside and remember, don't say nothing to the police. That was my mom growing up. Oh, yeah. The police were always around my mom's bar. My mom would pull me over and go, listen, remember, 
Don't say dick. You don't know nothing. My mom uh, went to a dance with her sister when she was 16. The sister was 15. And my mom lost her. And she felt she was responsible for us in Cuba. So when she went outside to look for her little sister, she was getting raped. Oh. And my mother took a bottle, broke it, and killed the guy, stabbed the guy. The guy eventually died. They had to ship her out of Cuba, bring her to the States. So then she went back a couple of years later with a Puerto Rican chick's ID because, you know, there's no 9-11. There was no TSA. They didn't give a fuck. You know, there was a time you just showed up at the thing and said, uh, I have the 7 a.m. flight. Who are you? Henry Rollins. All right, Mr. Rollins. I can use whatever. Now you have an ID. So when she went back to Cuba, she went under an alias. And when she came back to the States, that alias became, and then she opened up a bar and hmm. somebody else had to do the fingerprints for her, the whole fucking wow, deal. that's great. What so, a great story. Yeah, so she named her, uh, her street name was, her real name was Donora Valdez, but her street name was Sofia Cecilio. Do you, do you go visit Cuba? No. Have you ever been? I left the three, and let's just say, let's leave it at that. You know, I'm here, I'm having a good time. <laughs> so if, what, if you went back here, you get chopped up or something? I think they wouldn't let me back in. Oh, okay. I think the government would Because I, I went once, I went a few years what ago. What did you think? I loved it. Uh, Havana was a beautiful city. The food was amazing. Everyone plays an instrument, it seems. Every bar had an amazing piano player. I met this old woman behind a piano. She's beautiful. And she had a, a big bowl on her piano for money, tips and whatever, and a stack of her CDs. I said, I'll buy one of those. And I bought CDs from the local players. So they all have like a CDR of their music. I'm like, I'll, I'll buy all of it. This is like, you know, eight bucks. And you help, you know, it helps the local music scene. And um, I had one of the a great a, a great lesson that I get when I try. I've been to about a hundred countries. I, I go pretty far and wide. I I was thrown in a van with a bunch of people from Chicago to get around. I kind of had to be part of a tour group. I missed the lobby call to go visit some farm that Fidel like winked at many years ago. So we have to go see it. I mean, anything Fidel touched, you have to go look at it. It was a bit of a propaganda tour when I was there. I, so I missed the lobby call by like a minute. And I asked the guy in the lobby, I said, did you see a van? He said, yeah, your van just left. But he looked at the itinerary. He said, okay, your van's going to be at this farm in three hours. We'll get you to that farm and you can wait it out. So they put me in the local bus. And you pay like, like whatever it is, like 50 cents. And they explain, hey, get this idiot down to this farm. He lost his tour group. And the guy speaks no English, hardly any word. To, alone in this little school bus going down some country road we're outside of Havana and uh, he's trying to communicate with me he said uh, hello I said hello he shook my hand he's like you know reaching over with his right hand from the steering wheel and he said uh, baseball I said baseball we shook hands on baseball he goes me Cuba and I said me America we shook hands on that he's just we're like toasting with handshakes and he said uh, you like made it like a jet I, and I said, yeah, tres dias. Yeah. And he said, uh, me, no. I went, yeah, I know, man. I'm so sorry. And we just kept, uh, you know, shaking hands. And we got to this intersection where you make a right and you go to the farm. I figured I'll get out and I'll just walk. It's like three miles. He, It's a public bus route. He deviated from the bus route to take me to the farm. And he just kept finding all the English he knew. America, good. I said, Cuba, good. We shake hands on that. I shook the guy's hand like 10 times because he just wanted to be friendly and say, we can get along. And so when someone like wants to demonize a country or says something about Cuba, I said, man, you need to shut up because if you went, you'd really like it. And I had this great moment with this guy, just the two of us on this bus. And he dropped me off at the farm, and they were very nice to me. And I sat there and read the, a biography on Lincoln for like two hours and waited for the tour group, who wondered how I got there. But it was just one of those great experiences you get when you get out of the house and you get into the world. But I had a great time in Cuba. At night, when I was back in Havana, there's that long sidewalk by the shoreline with a retaining wall. Baladero. Okay. And the kids just hang out there because there's nothing to do. Right, they just it's like, like a boom box, and they just, they're just... Dance and... Yeah, yeah. just being young and beautiful. And, I, you know, I'm some old man walking by, and I would just walk amongst them, just watching them be young, and this is what you do on it at night. You just hang out with each other, got the music, and I would just kind of walk amongst them every night and just kind of take it in, and the air was great. And uh, I'd love to get back there. You know, you uh, do not consider yourself a religious person from over the years from me listening to you. I believe in the Stooges. You believe in the I Stooges. I believe in Iggy Pop, so. Uh, 
you know, you do so many great things. You believe in artists. You know, I always say that I'm not a comedian. I'm in the karma business. Hmm. And when did that hit you? That you're, I mean, you say some beautiful things. You know, you support. You know that those three guys are living in a van buy their fucking album. Yeah. You know, you. Well, you, well I was that guy in the van. <laughs> yeah, me too. We're all, we're all, yeah. we're all guys in that van. So, I mean, when did it come to you that we're not in the in the entertainment business, we're in the karma business? Early on for me, I come from punk rock, and so I've been in that world as, you know, a guy making records or whatever since I was 18. And the kind of music I always did, the kind of writing I've done, it's all like hard on sleeve kind of writing where people come up, that book you wrote, man, it got me through 11th grade. I can't thank you enough. You're like, okay. Or that album, man, I wanted to kill myself, but I put that record on and I got through. And so people have laid a lot of really intense information on me, like like just stories that'll kill your lawn. And from that, you know, I have a very human view of humans, as abusive as they can be, as, as infuriating as they can be on the news. I, I have these stories, you know, that where I'm like, man, that guy just cried in front of me and told me about his friend who killed himself. And they used to go to my shows and he misses them. And I can't help but like people because eventually you hang out with anyone, someone you hate the most. You'll get a story out of them. You're like, wow, okay. You're all right. You just like really made some bad decisions. I'm not excusing bad behavior, but as as angry as I can get with Homo sapiens or like people at the DMV in line, you know, there's like those moments where I, I kill them all. I, I keep coming back to the people I've met in, in my journeys through Africa who have nothing. They'll give you half of it just because they're kind, or you're lost, and like they'll walk you back to the main road just because they don't want you having a bad day, and. I've had so many experiences like that. It keeps the guardrails on my road where as angry as I get, I'm like, ah, oh, no, no, there was that guy I met in Haiti. He was real cool. And that's where I, I, I and it made me want to be a better person. So being talked to and told stories and traveling a lot, like going to, I've been to every continent and traveling like that kind of rough out, you see a lot of tough existences being endured by humans. And that, it hasn't softened me up. It's made my idea of humanity evolved. And so that's that's helped me with everything from my writing, what I say on stage, it informs what I say on stage, it informs like columns I write from what I've seen out in the world. So, you know, in this country, it's a great country, but we don't travel as much as I'd like us to. So when you hear some people, they'll talk about some country or some landmass, and they'll like, well, they're all like this. I'm like, so when was the last time you went? Well, I didn't go like, well, so you really don't know what you're talking about because I was there. <laughs> I'm no expert, but um, that part of the world invented geometry and was the first country who ever had translators for they could have books in different languages. So don't write them off as people who are scratching in the sand that that fast. And and so it's kind of just life experience, but in an extracurricular way, like I when I'm not on stage, like, you know, you tour, I tour. Touring gets me to like 19 to 21 countries per tour, like Europe, America, Canada, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Kiev, Russia, wherever. Um, but it's all the extracurricular travel I do just to go see a place. And that's what got me to Cuba. That was what got me to Haiti, Pakistan, uh, North Korea, uh, places like that. I, so I just go and dig the humanity. I'm not much on nat nature, like the mountains, that's nice, but I like cities and watching human mechanics. Like, how are you making your living? Where do you live? Do you live in that? Can I come in? Can I see how you get through your day? Like hiking through the slums in, in Bangladesh and just like for days and just like, go, okay, what do you do for a living? How do you make this work? And um, that kind of thing has really informed me how it informs my politics and just kind of how I see the world and how we go forward as a race, as a species. What I see with you that's fascinating is that, you know, most fucking people go to Hawaii or... You know, Italy, uh, the pasta fresh guy. That's you know? all good, too. And they go to Greece and have the olives. Not you. You're going somewhere where there's fucking something going on, bitch. Yeah. Like, we're going into, you know, something where there's something going on. That's come what back I really six pounds admire. lighter and hopefully without an internal parasite. Now, what's the fear? Is there any fear level when you go to these places that you the, might... No, just an awareness and studying any place I go to beforehand and study mainly for the culture. So if you're a single Western male in an Islamic country, 
uh, there's a few ways of the road that will really help you. If you're alone with a camera, a nice camera, like you got something you need to protect. And so you don't walk up to a woman and go, hey, how do I get back to my hotel? Ask a man. They just don't don't walk up and talk to a woman. This is not the way of the walk there. So learn where you where you're going to be going. Learn and always be polite. Politeness, if you're especially, I have no backup when I'm in these places. Politeness goes a long way, but being culturally aware alleviates a lot of uncertainty. So you kind of know how to be polite and not to blow it and get on anyone's nerves, especially if you're like walking the streets of a city alone, where there's like tough guys who want to roll you. Because I'm not a tough. I'm not, I'm not going to fight. You know, I don't want to fight. I just want to get me and my camera in and out of that place. And so it's a bunch of preparation. But fear, no. I'm not a tough guy, but I I just don't have a fear quotient, really. You know, I used to go to... I had friends growing up, and I would go to Harlem at 4 in the morning, and I could buy an 8-ball or a machine gun or a bazooka or a pound of coke. And my friends would go, you know, how the fuck do you do that? Are you not scared? And just because I think I saw that other side didn't make me scared. That's why you have no fear of it. Yeah, you kind of have to know where you are. And, you know, don't be naive. You can get cut up anywhere. I mean, we're in Southern California. This is a pretty rough patch of real estate. I've almost been killed here a couple of times. And so you just need to be just kind of always aware. Bring your New York with you. I mean, if you get mugged, like you didn't see that coming. That guy was telegraphing a block away. He sized you up. And, I, you know, you've seen like three guys. One guy's the muscle. One guy's the lookout. One guy's the distraction. I've seen the three. I've had one time in Bhopal in India, like the three guys are doing the thing. And they, I said, oh, so you're the distraction. There's the muscle and there's the lookout, right? And they're like, ah, oh, dude. <laughs> they just like walked away. But I said, good try, though. Good try. You know, I used to live in New York. I seen this. I saw you guys when you walked in. And so you, you need to just kind of know, just be looking around. Did you ever go to Brazil Like when, when they just had the... Uh, Olympics there, I saw them doing the pickpocketing and like they were regret like not just, not trying to hide it but like really aggressive. Yeah, in Brazil, you gotta watch it. That's a place where even I don't want to walk around at night because I'm just not looking to get cut up. Like good, good wisdom for traveling in Brazil: never leave your hood. Like I'll leave with no money. Like that's how you get stabbed. Forty to sixty bucks. Have something they can take so they go, I got over on him. I'm not going to stab him. Because if you have nothing like this, you, yeah, like, you gave me nothing. So always go out with a little bit of money. Leave the watch and the ID. But bring some money so when you do get robbed, you have a little something. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Leave something for the mouse. I've always yeah. said that. Yeah. As a former thief on the other end. <laughs> well, if you had something, I'm taking something. You got to leave something no, for you, the you, mouse. You got to give him something. And here I left because, and you got a thousand in your sock. Do you understand me? The real guy got a G note in the sock. Who's going to take his shoe off? I ain't got that type of time. Yeah. But I go for his pocket. He's got the small 40. Jeez. And I go off. I, I'm, I'm robbing in volumes. I got four guys at $40. That's fucking 160. I'm doing something. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And I'm that, having a party. But and that doesn't turn you off for, I mean, maybe going back to that place, but that doesn't turn you off for traveling in general? No. That's part of the fucking, that's it. it. It's part of it. And, um, and you didn't see it coming. And, and you learned a lesson. Like, I, how come I didn't see that guy? I got to go study that street better. And so having that kind of awareness has really helped me navigate. Like, when you travel alone any almost anywhere in Africa, man, you better just be looking around. Because it's just, you know, everyone's looking at you. Because you're not from there. I mean, like, you do not look local. And I heard Nigeria is the number one place in the world where they just rock you from A to Z. Well, they there's a lot of rob you at the, every level. Yeah, the hotel, but, but the, the restaurant. But, but the, a lot of Africa, there's just people in need, and they see you. When they see your well, Western type, they just immediately think money, and like, oh, I'll, I'll get his shoes. He has more, and um, you see, I watch families there in like you know, and they're in the city center or whatever, and you just they're just getting everything. People coming up and putting stuff in their hand and trying to charge them for it. I saw that a lot when I was in Egypt, and you see those kind of travelers who don't know how to kind of slip through crowds and you just got to be way more low key. They wear nice clothes. They just kind of stick out like peacocks, like hey, hassle me. And um, there's ways to kind of the street guys will follow you. And they try and get you into conversation. You just kind of politely go, "No, nah, I'm not the guy. Try him. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not him. I'm not, no, I'm not that guy." Now this year you're starting a tour in the states. Yeah, but then you finish the tour 
overseas. Yeah, I'll be finishing uh, like Kiev. 12, 15, I think, yeah. uh, December 15th. Yeah, finishing uh, Kiev, Ukraine. And what do you do at 12, 15? You come back, you sit over there for a couple of weeks. Here's what I was thinking of doing. I was thinking of getting out of Kiev. <clears throat> I'll probably have to go either to Frankfurt, London, or Schiphol, Amsterdam. That's the airport. And from there, I was going to go, uh, I think I'll go to Reykjavik, Iceland, so I've never been. I've already mapped out the three record stores. So I, I figure I should I should do that on the way back. I've never been. And it's a hop. You just, I can be out of any one of those airports. I can be there in three to five hours. So I'm How great that. is that to buy Sab Bloody Sabbath in the States and then go to Germany and see the UK release? I have all of them. No, I, I'm, I'm that guy, unfortunately. Really? Oh, yeah. I have to have every pressing. If it's a record I like... I have the test pressing, uh, every different pressing because there's something different on the label, mastered by a different engineer. I'm sadly that guy, a train spotter. Uh, but for records, you know, you're uh, you're this anti Hollywood guy. I heard that you live very modestly, very plainly, but you sank a ton into your music system. Yeah, I have a few systems. It's yeah, it's so important to you. What? I, I, I'm fucking like I love music. Listen, this is my life. Yeah, I would have done this. I just didn't have the patience, and I knew because of the drugs, I would have pawned the guitar. Right. I would have pawned the guitar and the Marshall. I, I know that already. Going in, I ended up with this because at 32, this was it. Right. This was it. And but, the microphone is screwed into the table. So yeah. This is it. But this was my original dream. It's so weird how I. I don't understand how people... This is my therapist. I don't need to go to a fucking therapist. I could sit down, put on that album by Richard Pryor. It wasn't something I said, and it could take me back to that time period. Yep. And I could know exactly what I was thinking. I could feel the sorrow from that time period. I could feel the happiness from that time period, and I get to deal with it that way. You know, whenever I put... Like, when I bought Master Reality... Perfect, time, perfect record. I bought Master Reality, and I went and I did THC Crystal, which is basically Gorilla Tranquilizers, and I hit an acid, and I put Master Reality on, and for some reason, The Exorcist was on. So I put The Exorcist, I put Master Reality on the cans, and I had The Exorcist on, and after, like, the third song, <laughs> I took Master Reality off, and I never listened to it again. You do know that. Like, I was like, this is You ever heard it again, ever? Oh, no, no. Okay, then, like, good. four years later, okay. I got the balls. It's like when I first bought House of the Holy. No quarter, I skipped over it right to the fucking, uh, wow. we got four already, but you can't wear steady, whatever. I wasn't ready for, for, uh, for no quarter at 12. At 18, once I did a hit of acid, I was ready for no quarter, but it was so weird how Master Reality, I was not ready for. But the purpose of the story I'm telling you is this is my psychiatry. Like it is yeah, me too. in a way. That's when I'm at my happiest is uh, when I put on a record. And I, I play records when I'm off the road. I try and listen to analog source literally every single day, minimum five records. I also try and buy one to three records a day, one way or the other. So there's always something coming in. And I'm always listening. And where to the something. fuck do you go? You just go to Amoeba. Or I, 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 for for catalog stuff, like say some band I like, they make a new record. I just wait for it to come out. I go, but I buy a lot of rare records, so I'm on bidding on eBay against some other loser mail. And so I have a lot of those kind of records coming in. Old punk rock from Scandinavia. I'm buying those records. That's all mail order, Discogs, eBay. Um, but I try and listen to. I was listening to records last night. I'll be listening to records tonight. Um, I got. I'm going to two shows over the weekend, so I'll be watching live music. But I, I try and listen to music every day, and it's. I immediately become happier when I have the music. On. Okay, so like, like yesterday, I put on that new hot band, Veta Grand, Veta Van, whatever. I put on two of their songs. So okay, I, like the new Led Zeppelin, great. Uh, last okay. night when I I didn't go out last night, I stayed home, and then. What did I listen to earlier? I listened to something. The B-52's first album. Great record. I have it on vinyl, but I was at home, so it was on YouTube. And like I, I went right back to 1980. I went right back to the fucking place I went to see him New Year's Eve when I ate a bunch of Quaaludes <laughs> with my buddies. And I remember the original guitar player. Yeah. You know, on that, the, like his licks on my private Idaho. And I get to the point where I, I can't lie to you or the people at home. Like, there's times I go, when I'm listening to an album, let's say Black Sabbath, Never Say Die, okay? 
I go through the emotions like Never Say Die makes me happy. Johnny Blade makes me happy. Great song. Uh, yeah. You're Coming Home Again Tomorrow. What's that one? I'm Sorry It Won't Be For Long. With all the pain I've watched you live with him. I don't know. Uh, I forget. But once I get to that one, uh, Junior's Eyes. Yeah. Once I get to Junior's Eyes, I start tearing. I start crying. Yeah, there's songs I on records I have to skip them because I can't there you hear go. them. There you go. There's a song on volume four, Changes. Tremendous. I can't hear it because uh, I broke up with a woman I'm still friends with. But when we were slowly breaking up and I put that song, I'm like, I'm never going to be able to hear this again. And it's been, I don't know, like 30 years. And I put it, I can't, I just can't do when it. When I would give Lee the acid and the drugs, <laughs> I would put on Changes. And I would tell him, you're going to go through some changes. <laughs> Let's listen to Tony better real quick before I on the second half. He had him like he had everyone in there, me, everyone. And this it was a ten, it was a jazz festival in Switzerland somewhere, Germany. And he, it, it, in a, less than a minute, we're all in the palm of his hand. I'm like, what is this? He just has you. And he's charismatic, he sings great, but the the charisma, I was like, what just happened to me? I'm in this guy's lap. He was incredible. I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that and the whole all of us us kind of leaned into him is amazing now i'm the type of person that's very hard for me to get a prop out of me but i give props when they do and in my world where i've been and what i've seen you are the real deal oh, thank you. and i tell you this because it's like most people do things a certain way you did it backwards and when i say backwards i mean that you know, I, he's getting into comedy now, so I love him like a little brother. We've been working together for seven years. I'll take a bullet for this guy. He does. He knows I breathe. I break his balls, but he knows I, I, I breathe for him. I, he goes to the hospital. He needs a lung. If they take that lung with THC in it, whatever, and his body, it's his. So I try to keep him under my wing. I pamper him in a way. I don't want him to go through the pain I went through as a comic, which is wrong. He has to. I told him the other day, you got to go to Oklahoma. I want to see how Jews do in Oklahoma. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Before a Jew could play in New York, you got to do fucking Oklahoma. If you can't do Oklahoma, then you got to keep going back to Oklahoma until you figure out how a Jew could play Oklahoma. Was that uh, Lenny Bruce? It was famous in <laughs> Lima, Ohio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lee. <laughs> and I told you, being a Jew in New York and L.A. is all right. Once you go deep, they, they'll come up to you and touch you. Like, <laughs> man, we ain't never touched a Jewish person before. And you're like, and so... Uh, here you are, this kid, hogging dies, whatever the fuck. You know, you're not doing drugs, you're working, black flag audition, you're in front of these fucking punk rock people that the kids today have no idea. Like, they got to see uh, Soundgarden and Pearl Jam with the pit and jumping in there. That, that's punk that. But what you guys endured in the 70s and early 80s was brutality. Much you know, different. Brutality. And, I, and I'd, I'd be a kid and I couldn't wait for Martin the Fag. To, I would be by the basketball court, and Martin the Fag would catch the New York bus about eight, 7, 7.30, which meant he had to walk past 38th Street Park about 6. I wouldn't even go home to eat, just to ask Martin the Fag, what are you going to go see tonight? And he'd tell me, Black Flag. I, he wouldn't say Black Flag. I'm just saying he would say, you know, Hitler's dick. <laughs> you know, they all had weird names. You know, here I'm starting to, because I was such a Catholic that I wouldn't listen to white music, Led Zeppelin, and there were devil music, so I would listen to black music at the time. I would listen to a lot of Earth, Wind, and Fire, and uh, uh, just I, 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 uh, the Temptations and shit like it's that. It's all good. But something about punk rock fucked me up a little bit. Like, there was no video, there was no on TV, but just the fact that people were yelling, and, and so I would go to him, who are you going to see tonight? And he would tell me, I gotta stop and get poppers at East West. That was the big record store in Union City. If you ever go to Union City, they had all the Anybody who played the garden, that's where you would buy the the illegal shit. The, from the people who taped the concerts. Oh, what is it? What concert cassettes? The bootlegs. The bootlegs. Yeah. You would buy them at East West. So you know, like Bonzo's birthday party. You that's know. a great one. That's famous. That's yeah. a famous one. Yeah. You know, the they drummer made that from, one over and over again. The drummer from Led Zeppelin. And, uh, you know, I would ask him all these fucking questions. And yeah, he was gay, and it was tough being a gay man in 1975 and 6. You know, some weeks he'd have a black eye, some weeks he'd have a missing tooth. 
there was always something with him, you know. So here you are, young man, going in front of little audiences, and then you go in front of these fucking, I mean, they're gorillas, these people at these punk rock concerts. And you even said it, that you learned a lot when you went up in front of, there was a big difference between 350 people than 3,500 people. I think you got your balls lit on fire. They would pull your hair. You learned how to control an audience. Yeah, you, uh, there was no barricade at, at a lot of shows. And so people just can come right up and just hit you. I mean, or uh, on my legs, there's I have scars of cigarette and cigars that they would just put them into my legs. Uh, some, they would take their keys and try and uh, stab you in delicate parts of your body. Um, if you shaved my eyebrows, you'd see lots of scars. And I see from, one here. Is that the one from Berlin? That's this is from Brazil. I, I need myself in the head in Santos and broke my head open. But um, the one here, that's a boot. Uh, the one here, that's another boot. I got kicked in the mouth. I mean, uh, ashtrays, cans, fists with rings. Uh, someone just walk up and just like punch you in the face and like, and their friends would go, yeah. And you're like, that's. I'm bleeding <laughs> and I didn't have the money to get stitched up. So I'd give like the clinic or whatever, a fake name and just sit in there and get stitched up. And finally I had to stop, stop bothering. So I got these crazy scars on my head from like things being thrown or people coming up and hitting you. And that was the first five years I did music with black flag. The audiences could be pretty hostile. And that was in America, Canada, Europe. They just, you know, you'd get, you know, some drunk guy or, you know, when you're young, you know, we're old now, but when you're young, it's that ram at the base of the mountain in spring where the 20 year old has to fight the other one. Like, I'm going to kick your ass after the show. Like, really, am I back in school waiting for 3 p.m.? And like these, if I had a dollar for every time a skinhead girl would come up to the van in the afternoon or in some parking lot of some bar we're playing, my boyfriend's going to beat you up after the show. I'm like, OK, thanks. And like that guy would materialize at least half of the time. And you're like, I, oh, yeah, I heard about you. And you'd have to get into it <laughs> and then load the gear out. <laughs> My introduction to you was really on Ari's podcast. That was really like the first time I really sat down mm -hmm. and, and, and listened to you. And I looked you up. And I, I've been in podcasts for six years. And I, I hate – there's a very hacky thing where people talk about hate online now. But when I looked you up, they were talking about you having a fight during the show, fighting the audience. And I – I get blown up. like even hecklers are like that's the top for me like a heckler I can't imagine during the middle of a show punching like having to have a fist fight with an audience member it was it, it got so utilitarian You're like okay get through the course got the course there's a lead bam hit him and get back to before the bridge because you know you're gonna have to pop this guy because he keeps swinging at your head like okay I uh, gotta get through the verse otherwise the guitar player will be you know get a demerit or whatever so you, it just became like it's tuesday evening crack back to the song where you just it just became part of your like because i don't i'm not i don't have a stomach for that kind of thing i'm really not looking to get in that situation so i'm not good at it but it, by 85 you're like ah oh, another night another boop some, <laughs> some guy and it was all neutralizing and not starting anything. It's always like neutralizing the thing or the guy waiting for you after the show. Like, ah, I have to neutralize this guy because I still have to load the gear out. I still have to drive to Nebraska and sleep in a Denny's parking lot next to another smelly male. And we're all just drying off from the show. It was that life you live when you're 20 something and, you know, you're kind of bomb proof and you can do it. And, you know, you, you get... still speak to anybody from Black Flag? No. Uh, only through attorneys. It's uh, Jesus Christ. you know, it's it's the modern age. We only get together to to, to litigate. <laughs> now in '96, <laughs> when you were opening for Ozzy, yeah, that was I great. Mean, he became because I, I can't. I got to tell you, you know, my mom died at 16. I was lost, and uh, between sabotage, this album behind me, megalomania, I had. I was in love with this girl, and every time her and I would have a fight, I'd take a hit of acid. And go home and listen to Megalomania. That was my breakup song. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what he. What, what is he saying? You know what song I'm talking yeah. about? Uh, fuck me. You know that whole fucking thing. And, and now instead, I won't be laid by you now. Fuck me. Like that whole thing. That was my process every time I broke up with the fucking girl. And you just toured with this lunatic. And to him, he was your world. I mean, what was that like? The first time I met Oz. How did you even meet him? Um. He, we got the offer to do some shows with Ozzy, and, and I this said, is the Henry Rollins band. Yeah, the Rollins, Rollins band, yeah. Rollins band. And, and no I, I, I said yes on behalf of my bandmates 
and they were kind of lukewarm into it. We were in the middle of trying to write an album. So I said, okay, learn, relearn the set. We're going down to Florida to play with Ozzy. They're like, really? And I'm like, yeah. Throwing my weight around and, the, and smile. We're playing with Ozzy. So I want to meet that guy since I was like, what, 12? So we go to this like 20,000, you know, like his home are these mega places and where you take the golf cart like four floors down underneath the field where the utilitarian dressing rooms are, like those showers with for 80 people. And we're sitting under these uh, fluorescent lights on the benches and there's an apple, a can of Coke and like a banana. That's like the backstage. We're like, wow, the big time. And the door explodes open and in comes Ozzy with a cigar in one hand, he's like, which one of you guys is Henry Rollins, man? I, I said, I am. Hey, man, my name is Ozzy, man. Thank you for being on the tour. I hope you have a really good time, man. Uh, the PA is really big. It's played as loud as you want. Blow it up if you want. Have a great time. Ah, he left. And it was the whole total time, seven seconds. <clears throat> it was just fantastic. And I'm like, wow, I just met Ozzy Osbourne. It was like this hurricane. And all you could smell was this tobacco, the, the, the cigar. And so I said to the guys in the band, I said, fellas, no one in this crowd wants to see us. They only want one band. And it was like typo negative us and then Ozzy. And so we played. No one threw anything at us. I was like, OK. And I, I went up, you know, showered, and ran back up to the top to watch Ozzy because I'm a fan. And he's standing on stage right where if he goes to his left, he'll be walking onto the stage. And the band's out there. And he's kind of standing there. And I walk up. Hey, Ozzy, how you doing? He's like, is there anyone out there? I said, it's like 25,000 people. I mean, yeah, it's packed. I said, what do you mean, is there anyone out there? He's like, I always get nervous, no one's gonna show up. I said, when, is, when have you ever had that problem? He said, I can't remember. I just get, you know, I get depressed all day worrying if anyone's gonna show up. <laughs> and I went, wow. I said, no, I think there's a few in there. And he just went back to kind of like just standing there with his hands in front of him. I'm like, okay, well, I'll just stand here with you. He went back to like this weird statue-like state. And then Sharon Osborne comes up, Ozzy! And he, like, just, she, just your dentures fly out of your mouth. She just yelled at him. He went, ah! She like, get out there! And he was just kind of spacing out and waiting for her to give him the shove. And he kind of walks out there, the uh, flick, uh, the switch is flicked, and he becomes like, let's go crazy! And the place went completely bananas. And they went into whatever the first song was. And I w watched him a couple of nights, and it was like so much fun just watching him with that audience because the affection they love that guy but he loves them too and it was really fun um and i you know, after that first night i i flew on the family jet to the private island the hotel they're staying at because i was going to stay with them and it was just like living the osborne lifestyle for like a few hours was trippy i mean it has the aussie logo on the side of the jet the pilot's waiting good evening aussie how was your show it was great man <laughs> And uh, we drank Diet Pepsis as we flew to some designer island, and he told me how they made the Paranoid album. And just, he told me this great story about recording Paranoid. How long were you on the tour with him? Uh, like half a week. That's it? Yeah, just That's a few shows. That's all you needed. That's no, all you it needed. was all we were offered. You know, they probably just didn't have a band for that slot for like these shows, and they threw it out to my manager. And like we, we were lucky. Uh, Typo Negative was the other band on the bill. Wow. Great, great band. Great band. And uh, really great. And I don't know if they had more shows. Like the next time I saw Pete Steele, like a year later, we just didn't, I didn't ask him if he did more shows. I, I think he kind of knew them before I met them. I think he probably done maybe Ozfest or something. I think he knew them before. But I, I've known the Osbournes ever since. Like I see them every few years for something. And like, you know, Sharon and Ozzy, the kids are always like super nice to me. Like they always remember my name and they, they couldn't be nicer. It was like, it's I, I'm a fan mainly. I'm, I buy records, I go to shows. And it's great when people that you really admire for whatever they do, that they're actually cool. That's actually cool. And um, Ozzy and all the Sabbath guys, actually, they're all super friendly, self-effacing. They're extraordinary, actually. They're hilarious people. Always making jokes. It's crazy how you went from most people would have done it the other way. They would have gone spoken word. Uh, you went from this violent fucking punk rock world into this cool guy on stage telling your thoughts. Yeah. With nobody punching you in the face now. Nobody no, think, lighting your balls on fire. Things are a little friendlier now. And now, you know, because I, I'll never forget uh, Errol Smith in 80. 78, they started having problems. Joe mm -hmm. Perry left. Yep. 
was replaced. Brad Whitmore left. Yeah, they did the replaced, Night in the Ruts record. Which a lot of people don't like, and I kind of like, but then they did the Knights of the Ruts tour, and it was the Ruts. I saw them open for Ted Nugent, like in 76, mm -hmm. and they weren't really that good. And then years later, Nugent would open for, for them. them. Can yeah. you believe that shit? And well, who's bigger than Aerosmith, so? No, and uh, I went to see Aerosmith at a place called the Soap Factory hmm. in Richfield, New Jersey, down from the Chan's Dragon Inn, my best Chinese restaurant in the fucking country. They just made the top 30 yeah. restaurants in NewJersey.com, the best General Tao's cat you've ever had in your fucking life. You understand me? <laughs> They've been there, the best agros. But I went to see Aerosmith there at the Soap Factory, which is like your local, which was very sad. It was on the way out, and everybody was really bad. Well, Steve was... Uh, yeah, Steven was beautiful then. He but was, but uh, he was, uh, had some challenges. I saw them... The first time I saw them was when Walk This Way was the single, so that would be uh, 75, Toys 75, in the Attic yeah. tour. First arena show I ever saw. They opened with Rats in the Cellar. It's a good show. We were in the cheap seats, so we got like kind of broken sound and kind of rockets through the hockey arena. And when it finally gets to you, you don't know what song it is. So it was a, this is the smell of cheap arena weed and Aerosmith like two seconds later, <laughs> the slap back. But it was cool. I told uh, I met I met uh, Stephen Perry years later and told him the story and he appreciated it. The same same place I saw. Nugent and Van Halen and Led Zeppelin. It was, it was just—it's a—it was the local hockey arena. It's gone now. There's, a, I think, a bigger one in this place. This is in Maryland. Yeah, Largo, uh, the Capital Center. Largo. It's, it's where I saw Led Zeppelin, and um, I saw Van Halen on their first album tour open for, for Nugent. I saw them open for Sabbath. Oh yeah, that, see yeah. that was a disaster. Yeah, I I uh, I've seen photos of of them, them as a group shot, all disaster. mooning the camera. I still remember Bill Ward snorting in between, like. Like, I, we were sitting so close to the right-hand side or the left-hand side right. that I remember watching him, like, in between takes, like, just put something on the snare drum and do a fucking line of me sitting there going, holy shit, that is tremendous. But they were horrible, going home and going... Was that the Never Say Die tour? Yeah, that was it. Yeah. It was over. He the, called it a fucking jazz band. He didn't like. He doesn't like Never Say Die. Almost every show from that tour got bootlegged. Yes. And I have cassettes and LPs. How do they sound? Really, they're playing everything really fast because the whole. I think the whole band was coked, but they're going through everything at like one point something speed. Like it's just like whoa, guys, slow down. But it's the same set, like rock and roll doctor, all those songs. But that every show on that on that tour got bootlegged, and I've got at least. 10 or 15 shows from that tour just because they're available bootlegs in the 80s for cheap. They're like two LP bootlegs. Same set every time. So right now, today, what do you say you got in the house? How many albums? Good question. I've never measured by number. It's a, it's a lot. It's just walls of them. And then there's uh, boxes of singles, a lot of singles, and tons of cassettes. There's just lots of music media and six stereo systems. I still remember EPs buying the Rat EP. Yeah. Buying Missing Persons EP. Right. Uh, with Terry Bozzi on the drums or whatever his name was. We had the son on, Rainin. Yeah, he's a Zappa disciple. Yes, yes, yes. Joe Garage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tremendous drummer. Monster drummer. Monster drummer. Incredible. One of the guys that stuck out, like when I saw them. Yeah, Steve Vai is from those, uh, you know, the, the day that those days of Zappa. He's another incredible musician. Really good guy. I, I met him last year. Great guy. How was it shooting Heat? It was, it was. So now I, mean, I want to talk to you. Two more things and we'll get you out of here. I know you guys are I'm, busy today. Uh, I'm not in a hurry. I'm, we're on your schedule, truly. I have a, this is a short story, but it's a real good one. Um, um, I'm trying to remember her name. Because you 85 was, 80, 94 was a great year for you. You shot mnemonic yep. and you shot. A and I was on tour with a band with a big, we had a big single that year. It was a great, great year on every possible level of a young man on tour. Uh, before shows, after shows, during the day, everything was fantastic. And we're making money so I could pay the band in full. We were living well. Everyone got their own, own hotel room on a night off, which was kind of a, that took a while for us to get to that. So we're touring comfortably, but we're playing hard. Um, and so things were really good. And somewhere in 94, 95, I'm trying to remember the nice casting person. She's re really popular, re very, very well known. Anyway, she brings me in to read for a part for Heat, 
And it's one of those things where you get there at noon. You get there at eleven forty-five for the noon. And they're like, "Okay, they're running late." I'm like, "Really? I should just go because I'm not getting this part." She came out and said, "Okay, you're going to get this part. I really want you for this." Michael Manns listens to me, so just hang out, calm down. I was like getting all pissed off that I'm waiting. So I was like, you know, two hours wait because it is what it is. So I walk in, I do the lines, and he goes, "Okay, you're fine," but. You have scenes with Al Pacino, and I have a very tense set because at, at that point, apparently, Pacino and De Niro, they don't get along for some reason. It's not my business. No one told me anything, but tension. So they said, um, I don't need any more tension, so you're going to get this part if, if Al Pacino likes you. I said, okay, what does that mean? He said, you're going to meet Al Pacino, and if he likes you, you can have the part. If he doesn't like you, then you got to go because I, I can't have one more iota of tension on this set. I'm going to... I said, okay. So what, how am I, what is, what's going to happen? He says, you're going to have lunch with Al Pacino. I said, okay, so when do we set that up? He said, we're leaving right now. <laughs> and we left the building. And we go to some restaurant near, we're in like Century City, and all of a sudden there's Al Pacino. And I said, uh, Mr. Pacino, I mean, like, I didn't know what else to call him. I said, Mr. Pacino, how do you do? Call me Al. Call me Al. I said, okay, Al. Al. And we had this great lunch. He's hilarious. He's really friendly. And at, at the end of the lunch, he looked at Michael and said, Michael, I like him. And that's how I got the part. And every day I had scenes with him. There was one scene where uh, my body double got thrown through the window. Right. That was not me. It was my stunt double who actually had to go get stitched up. He cut his head open after the second take. Anyway, so there's that part where they cuff me because I'm a bad guy. And they uh, wait, and I get like hauled out of there. You're in the same with the Indian, also. They well, come to get you. West at the Duty? Apartment. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They come yeah. to get you in the apartment. So right. um, that scene ends with me cuffed. And it's a Michael Mann film. So the cuffs are real, the guns are real, the bad guys are ex real bad guys. Everything's real. And so I'm really cuffed uh, behind my back, sitting on this couch, waiting for props to come and uncuff me over and over, like 80 takes. And it's a big film, I'm low priority, so it's like minutes to get uncuffed. So I'm just sitting there, cuffed. Al Pacino would sit and keep me company. He's a really nice guy. He could have gone, you know, and done something else. He would sit with me and just mess with me, put his arm around me, give me a magic marker. I'm gonna put a mustache on him. And he was just so cool to me every morning. Henry, how are you? I'm like, I, I'm better now. How are you? Not so good. And he'd tell you what was the matter. And he was nice to everyone on that set. And that was just a, a huge moment for me as like some BS artist, actor. I hadn't taken lessons. Yeah, I just like, what the fuck am I doing I just, here? Totally. Jesus. I always get worried that the Hollywood cops are going to come and like, all right, come here. I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. They figured it out. And I'm just, every day I'm on that set, like, what am I doing here? And he, it was just a great thing you know people love that movie and even in airports to this day they go like, you were that dude in heat right i'm like yeah thanks and that, that was just a lucky break it was a small part anyone could have done it but um it was just really cool to have those moments and watch michael mann work i mean he's a, a genius director now did you have anything with de niro on that no sir only a phone call where we both did voiceovers and they right they right right you talking later. to a you talking to a dead man on the line that you one. Talking and to then, you? Uh, you watch the movie we're having a conversation but um if i i was i did a uh, Colbert a couple of years ago and he was on before me and they kind of get him in and out of the building you never see him and I, I wanted to meet him of course and I, I wanted to say hey we had that co distended conversation uh, in heat now that would have been my opening line but I never got to meet him you know it's funny I, I did two movies with him the first time I didn't really have any contact with him I saw him and I saw his social uh, problem like he has like a he can't be around crowds. It was a. He seems like he keeps himself to keeps himself. Keeps himself. You know, yeah. Michael Rappaport has the funniest joke of the year. He says that De Niro didn't say nothing for thirty years until Trump became president. Now he's talking Trump. Yeah. Trump made De Niro it's, it's, talk. It's interesting because seeing it took him thirty just, fucking years for him to say anything. But just seeing him on like talk shows, like Colbert or whatever, like whoa, because like you'd see him doing tours to promote a movie and he's so uncomfortable he was so uncomfortable he just doesn't want to do it no he just and, wants to do the work i think i think uh, he didn't like I, I saw him one time and it was so bad that i saw him do oh, 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 oh when he got the actor studio oh god the guy would <laughs> ask him the question he'd go you know what it is yeah, he's just like not he that was, guy he's just not that guy some no, people like, are just not that guy he just wants to do the work he's a true artist and it's so funny when no i think that 
We all have a little thing. I all think we all. You need or, your time. Or, 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 or you're things. an only child, are you not? Yes, sir. Okay, that that I'm an only child. So you you know when it's time to go into your room. That's most of the time. That's yeah. most of the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm so a pretty solitary little, person. And that's what you, you know, we all have this yin and this yang. And we shine in the yin, and our yang is where we don't shine. And hmm. his acting abilities and his little things are great. And, you know, uh, at that time they shot The Sopranos in Jersey on that same fucking street. So when they found out they were shooting Analyze That, they went down there. There had to be, you know, 9,000 people on the streets. I'm shooting my scenes with Anthony Lampagli. I got nothing to do with De Niro. But I just want to get a glance at the guy. And at one time, he didn't know that these 900 people were out in front of his trailer. And he opened the door. And it was like he seen seeing them. And he fucking just slammed. <laughs> and they're like... Bobby, Bobby, come out! And he was like, "Well, that's, that's it." And but you know, that's not cool to have a trailer where. Yeah, yeah, they just I mean, they just didn't know the logistics. They didn't know it wasn't anybody's fault. They yeah. didn't know that the Sopranos shot in Carney, New Jersey. They didn't know any of these. Yeah, whenever I'd been in a film with big talent, man, you can't get yeah, near them. No, you can't get near them. But this yeah. this was just a faux pas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we were shooting two cameras at once, so you had a B uh, camera. You know, when I shot Spider Man too. They were shooting B and A well, every just day. Get it done. Yeah, yeah, you're just getting it done. It's a two hundred million dollar fucking budget, so we're, we're, we're ripping through. Well, this. you can amortize it down to an hourly rate. I learned that on uh, Bad Boys too. They said, you know, this movie takes this much an hour to make. I was like, I never thought of it that way. Producers do. Are you kidding? Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> every when I day. Sh have you ever shot New Orleans? No, I've when, done a lot of shows. When I went to shoot New Orleans, it was funny. The R.I.P. James Gandolfini. He did a he did a, a, a Sean. Who played uh, Piccoli? Jeff Spicoli. Sean Penn. Sean Penn movie. And he went to a strip club the night before, and somebody put a roofie in his thing. Oh. And he didn't wake up and make the scene, and he had to pay the day rate. The day rate was $450,000. Yeah. He paid it because he was not there. He said, no, I, no, before you yell at me, I'll just do what I did on The Sopranos. I'll just pay the day rate. What is it? Because he would disappear <laughs> from The Sopranos for three days at a wow. time. Wow. Yeah, they just had the autopsy of James Gambafini on true tv whatever that yeah. autopsy. have you ever watched that show no they have the autopsy the la the final hours of people oh yeah no i've seen that i didn't know yeah, and okay. they had the final and i watched it just to see if they would talk about the drug problem that was existent oh i didn't know yet I, I didn't, yeah nobody really knew they had it mm -hmm. i heard it because i'm a druggie yeah i'm a druggie so i knew people in new york that said oh you're fucking nuts he would just but uh, I don't even know what the fuck we're we talking about here i lost my consciousness here new orleans uh new orleans where what was the daily rate, the hourly rate? Like it's fucking huge. Yeah, it's no joke. That's why you know, I'm never late to things like that because I, you know, I'm never late anyway. But uh, you see what these producers are up against because they got Sony or someone breathing down their neck, and then you have a, you know, a difficult actor. He's not coming out of his trailer. Like, oh no, I know I've been in films where he's not coming out of his trailer for another hour because he didn't get his twelve-hour turnaround, and he's he's mad. And uh, Henry, do you mind doing your scene to a different actor? I said, man, just give me a C stand with a smiley face on a post, and I'll just do the scene. Just keep moving. See, you and I are, are very happy. I've noticed that in all the things I watch about you. Uh, happy you, when I'm working. Even on Rogan, you said something that it was so therapeutic that I did it recently, and I'm a better comic for it. I'm a better dad for it, and I'm a better everything for it. You know, I'm a fucking criminal. You know, I went to prison, I got, a, I got a GED, I got left back in the seventh grade, my mom died, and I focused on that. And on Rogan, you said that one day you wrote a list of all of the albums you wrote, the books you wrote, the music you wrote, the movies you were in, the TV shows you were in, and I did that recently. Hmm. I was feeling like shit before I shot the Netflix special, and afterward, even worse, uh, you know, I wasn't going to pull a fucking Bourdain. I'm not known for that. I'm a fucking Catholic. I can't leave here to go to hell if you're already in yeah. hell. But I actually did what you said, and I look at my accomplishments. I stopped looking at the person who I was, and I started looking at who a person I became hmm. because of your list. Oh, wow. That's cool. So I just want to let you know that, that that list just got me over one of the toughest times of my life hmm. at the age of 55. I didn't look at, you know, that's why I always tell comedians, get a fucking day job. 
Because when you don't have a day job, you don't think about what you have. You think about what you don't have. Henry Rollins just got heat. Well, how come I don't fucking have heat? You know why you don't have heat? Because you're not fucking in a day job. You wouldn't be thinking about heat. You'd be thinking about fucking working. And now the time that you do have, you're more focused on what the fuck you need to do instead of spreading your day out to 11 hours. Nobody cover 11 hours when they're a comic. There's going to be some porn. There's going to be some you porn jerking off. There's going to be some music. But if you have something for five hours, that takes your mind off of the things that you don't have. You've always been. You know exactly who you are. There's no fake in you. You didn't show up with nine agents. I mean, from A to Z, you're just a gentleman, man. I try. I have my good days and bad days. Oh, no, we all do. We yeah. all do. But you, like I said, you have, you're the reason why I do a lot of this shit the way I, after I saw you on Rogan, you simplified a lot of shit for me. For somebody who didn't like school, you're a fucking genius where it's necessary. Like, who gives a fuck about geometry? You are what intelligence really is. You are a circle. I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, you know. So I'm really happy that you took the time. Oh, I know that I don't want to say the word promoting. It's a shitty word. They're going to watch it because you're the artist that you are. On uh, August 10th, you have something coming on on Showtime. What, I do. What's the what's the name of the game? It's called uh, Keep Talking. Keep Cal. Talking, cocksucker. No, say one it, more it, fucking it, word, and I'll stab you in the eyeball. I say. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, so that's change it. the title. <laughs> uh, and this is spoken word. Well, it, it's this what I do up there. A lot of it's funny, but I'm not I, very I, funny. I don't write funny material. I just kind of comment on that which is funny. So I, I just report from the field. And sometimes it's funny, but sometimes it's not. It's very funny because it's subtly funny. Yeah, you I, have I, a line about work that you didn't want your life to be a, a Bruce Springsteen lyric. Yeah, I almost died, and, and I was over oh, called you at home and said no, because I grew up on Bon Jovi. You know, well, let's break. What's that song? We'll, uh, we'll bust them out. We'll break their hearts forever, forever. Never say goodbye. That's New Jersey lyrics. Right. You know, we'll break that. We'll bust out. We'll leave, and we'll break their hearts. You know, we'll get out of this fucking dump. You know, like you use that to describe your work day. Like you didn't want to be a Bruce. I laughed my ass off. I don't know what video you said it on. Yeah, it's I just a, my ass when off. I was young, I was like, I'm gonna be a, the guy in the song. You know, I'm gonna knock up the local girl, and I'm just gonna see the end of my life every day in this in a in a place like this. You know, whatever minimum wage job I'll be scraping away at, and eventually, you know, I'll screw up with a girl and all of a sudden i'll be a dad and i'll be that guy in the song you know like get the fuck out of me when i got out of prison i got married i got a job as an estimator i thought that was the american way my mother came from fucking cuba for me to live this way and i think i would have died of boredom yeah and i'm not putting the working men down i know it wouldn't have worked for me you know there's some people they're just not friendly in the straight world like, you can't give David Bowie a day job at Copy Mat. He just can't. He, he can get, he understands how the machines run, but he just can't cope. And I realized early on, I'm like, I'm nuts. I'm not going to hack the, the, the real world or the straight world. It's going to hurt. I can do it because I'm tough enough to hack it, but it's going to be really unenjoyable. I need somewhere I can be a maniac. And that's where music saved me. Because like, you know, a guy like Iggy Pop, you can't give him a straight job. He'll just burn the place. I mean, or he'll forget to show up because he'll he's just not in part of that world. And it's not putting down anybody. I respect anyone with a job. Is this that I realized early on, I'm not going to fit in, man. I got to find something for weirdos. And thankfully, I found a whole universe of work for if you're weird. And that's how I live. I'm, I'm strange. Do you still feel at times that you don't fit in? Because I live that every yeah, fucking I, day. Yeah, I, I don't fear it or hate it. I just stopped trying to be bummed out that I didn't. I really wanted to be like everyone else, like have the normal stuff. And I realized me too. Uh, several me too. years ago, I'm like, no, it's just never going to be me. So stop trying and failing and wasting people's time and stop feeling bad about it. Because they're not bad, and you're not bad. So just go be weird. Don't hurt anybody. And just go do your thing. And so I kind of went, oh, I am, I'm a stone-cold weirdo. So I'll just go get that work done. <laughs> and not even try to, to hang. 
Did you watch Steven Tyler on Joe Rogan? No. If you have a chance. I will. He's a great storyteller. He's he yeah. told and it's you look at the winners in life and they all have little things, even though they have rough patches in their life. I mean, you have you've lived the life that I lived, but I lived it with drugs and prisons and bullshit. You've suffered, you know, with what happened. You you were involved with the West Memphis Peace. So, I've had some ups and downs. You, you as understand. We all do. You understand so many things. You see, so you you witness a very horrible thing happen yeah. in front of you. You know, I found my mother dead on the floor with a purple fucking left arm. You know, you see all these things, and you have the disposition and the outlook that you have, and uh, it's just a fucking. If if everybody was, if more people were like you. We'd have such a way better Earth. Like well, we'd people. have more traffic jams, <laughs> probably less efficiency, but uh, the music might be good. Uh, what was your favorite lineup of the Rollins band all those years? Uh, the ninety, the eighty-seven to ninety-two lineup, because you had the great uh, New Jersey. Trent, New Jersey rhythm section of Andrew Weiss on bass and Sim Kane on drums. And that was just one of the most amazing rhythm sections I've ever seen in any band anywhere. And they were just loose and tight at the same time. They're like a slinky. They're so elastic and precise and mathematical, but they could throw it away when they wanted. And no matter what you put on top of them, me and the guitar player always looked good because they were so good. And then after that, I had a different lineup, which was same drummer, different bass player, Melvin Gibbs, who's great in a different way. He's just more, just different, amazing. Uh, but that that one lineup, it just it had this elastic Sabbath P-Funk smashing thing that I really enjoyed. We would just go out there and just like smash audiences flat. Now you as eclectic as I am, like if I come to your house with some Hindu on a flute and I put them on, would you give them a listen to Oh, I might have more of that guy's records than you do. That's what I'm talking Yeah, yeah, about. no, I'm that guy. It's, uh, I, I love music. I love... Yeah. I, I buy it from all over the world. And I, and I, and there's a lot of bad music I don't like. There's a lot of shit yeah. I don't like that I have disagreements with people. No, but, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, can't, you can't like it all. There's just not enough time. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure just to... Thank you. Just to sit with you. Let me see if there's anything else I want to bring up. You know, the wall with the smoke and burst getting stabbed. The fucking story you told of the guy getting stabbed at a show, I relate to you. Oh, well, in the back of the venue, in the parking oh, lot? you didn't want to make it funny, but the guy got stabbed. That yeah. fucking killed me because I just did a show in Nyack where the guy heckled me, got up to go to the bathroom, and two of the fans of the podcast <laughs> followed him in, hit him in the head with a bottle. And the guy was bleeding on the way out. The cops were like, you want to press charge? He's like, I don't want to do nothing. I'm just happy to be here. He goes, this is the best light, night of my life. He right. goes, I got to meet Joey Diaz and I got six stitches or some shit. You know, describe to people when you're, when you're up there, that magic that you feel. Like, I don't feel I'm better than them. Oh, no. I'm with them. Yeah, for me, it's uh, service. I, I consider myself uh, like a blender or a toaster oven. I, I'm a component. I'm like a, a frozen yogurt machine. Like want a pint, want a quart, I'll go all day. I, I output. And so let me make you a radio show. Let me put together a great show and let me uh, go on stage and go on for too long and, and really knock it out of the park. I want, I'd pay to go on stage. And, and so I love being up there. And so for me, I have an obsession with the audience and I always tell them, I said, I, I'm so desperate for your affection and your approval. You have no idea. And they always laugh. But it's true. I, I need them more than they want to be at the show. I really, so I don't have stage fright. I, just, I can't wait to go see them. I love those people. And when they, you know, they write me, I got to write them back. I, I, I meet them on the street since I was young. Henry, I'm like, yeah, man, hey, thanks. They go, hey, Henry, thank you. I'm like, no, I need you more than you need me. Are you kidding? Without you, I got nothing going on. I got no one to make all this stuff for. And so um, I've been up since about 5 o'clock this morning working on radio shows for my little radio show on KCRW. I'm sitting there like, well, that song has to go after that one. Okay, I'm, they're going to love this. I'm, I'm always in preparation to do something for you, the audience. And so when I'm finally there with them, I, I love being up there. I, I bring a stopwatch on stage so I don't go on for too long. Because I'm like, oh, no. It's like, I, I got to let you people what go. What do you like doing? What do you mean? How much time do you think is appropriate for you? I, it's, what I do is not appropriate. 
It's awful. <laughs> no, it's really bad. Oh, my God. It's like I'm looking into a mirror. It's like I'm listening to my thoughts. I look down at the stopwatch, and it's like two hours and seven minutes. I'm like, no, I have to start landing this jumbo jet of crap somehow. And it's going to take half an hour to finish this story, even with some edits. Okay, and here's how I'm going to end the show. And I look down, it's like two hours, 43 minutes. I, I apologize. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And they're like, no, no, it's fine. I go, no, it's not fine. You have a life. Go, go, get out of here. Go get back to it. So I think an hour 50 is probably better it's hard for me to get off stage more than after like two hours is minimum and it's just because i don't want to so and on the last tour we kept just trying to shorten the show and anything that was, was less than two hours 40 i'd look at my road man and goes i'd show him the stop or see 233 i'm getting better and you just laugh <laughs> and so, you always change it up your shows like you always yes this, this tour you're doing something different well this this tour is really static it's a bunch of slides so i'm showing through a high resolution projector and i'm telling the story behind the photo so it, the the, fo the folder of photos does not change I, i'll i'll revolve a few but the story is the story when i'm on stage just me and a microphone it's like a set list for a band i've got the new album you know the new material like this story this story this story but Within a month of being on the road, I usually do like if a 30 day month, I do 29 to 30 shows. I, I hate days off. My next run is like 46 shows in 46 days. There's a night off, but I'm doing two sets in Portland. So uh, I don't like nights off. And you do Mondays and Tuesdays. Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And you feel and that you still get the most out of the audience on a Tuesday night. It, it's time is on tour is fluid to me. It's all it's always Saturday night. Okay. If they're there, Saturday night in New York. Don't screw this See, up. See, in my mind, I want to be on Saturday because then I get everybody that I could to come out. I feel like on Monday, people are going to go, you know what? I got to work on Tuesday. And they do. And you don't always fill the place <clears> up. <throat> but you get who you get. And if you're smart, you're happy they showed up and you, you rock their world. That's just me. That's and, me, too. I yeah, don't give a fuck but about you know, what, you know what? That's, that's, that's most performers. They just want to do a good show. Most performers I've met, no matter what music or comedy, whatever, they just want to kill themselves to do a great show for the audience they just it's not about the money or the applause it's about doing something truly good and hoping someone likes it and and so um what was exactly your question uh same stuff every night okay um within 10 shows something has happened in the news like some country caught on fire but i was there two years ago so now i can talk about the last time I was in Syria. And so I'll talk about that. Or something happened in this state. Well, here's what happened to me when I was in that state. Or I was there when that thing on the news happened. And so I can connect a dot so that memory gets pulled into the set because now I can attach it to this. And so within a month of being on the road, I have about six hours of working material just because I've been able to associate. Oh, I remember that. Boom, it comes in. Or I have some uh, interesting sociological opinion slash theory that I think I want to extol to the audience. And so within 10 or 15 shows, I have too much material. So that's when I start rotating things through to keep myself kind of leaning into it. So I'm not pulling the string out of my chest and doing the talking doll thing. And that way, when the material remains kind of familiar, but not like I do put in that comma in the same place every night, I'm more in the moment to borrow the actor's term. Because I, I, like I said, I, I'm doing shows for like a year and months at a time. Uh, and I have to keep it fresh to myself because an audience, as you know, you can't fool them. They have a, a canine sense. Like they know when you're phoning it in. Even if it's one line, like, oh, he doesn't want to be here. Screw you too. And I can't do that to I an audience. I can't do that to an audience. Right, no, you can't do it. Because you, know, you think of what their evening is like. They just got out of a cubicle. Babysitter, parking, Dinner. That's a big night that's out. That's a big night out. Like, I that's think a, about that that's too. a paycheck chunk. They're like, okay, this better be good. And um, I think about that. It's not their money I'm concerned about. It's their time. It's their not. I don't concern about my money. I'm concerned about their money, but mainly their time. They don't get this Tuesday night back. So it can't be. Oh, it's a guy on a Tuesday night. He's going to dial it in. Oh no no no. This is your date night. <laughs> You're going back home to the kids. You're up at 4 a.m. Feed the kid, go to the cubicle in the in the bad car. I get it. So I never dial it in. It's always like, you know, New York Saturday night fucking, to me. Listen, I, the problem I had the last couple months was I had so much respect for the audience that I wouldn't let myself be who I am. But that's why they came. 
They came for you to be you. That's right. Yeah. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm trying to be a stand-up. I'm not trying to be the wild man who I am. Yeah, just be you. And now they got a fucking problem. Ever since I did the list that you did, and I did a couple thinking, like I'm only going to the store. You know why I only go to the store? Because metal sharpens metal. I don't want to be fucking around no more. I was going to all these other comedy clubs, and why? Why? I'm 55. I got a five-year-old. I don't have this much fucking time. So now I'm going up there with predetermined material. But anything that comes into my fucking heart straight from my balls that's real, <laughs> that I think is funny, whether it, whatever, I'm laying them out there. Fuck the order of the material. Fuck the organization. I'm going to give you an hour of my time that's going to rock your fucking world. Yeah. And uh, part of that was your mentality, the immigrant mentality, and just this podcast to me keeps me in check. What you said, when these people come up to you on the street and stuff like that, they say, thank you for coming. Like last week I was in Salt Lake City. Hmm. They're like, why would you come to Salt Lake? And I told everybody, I go, I could feel the love from you Yeah, because you're here. Of course I'm coming here. I'm coming here. Yeah. But it's so weird how when I went to Salt Lake, like, I'm so thankful to be doing, like, when are you going to retire? When uh, they put you in a fucking casket. Yeah, I don't. I can't That's think it. of it. I can't think That's of it. That's it. I can't think of it. Well, I don't know what I would do without them. Like, if I didn't have a tour to get looked forward to or or knowing it's coming up, I don't know. Because I've been touring since 1981, averaging up to about 100 shows a year for 30-some years. I don't know what else. I just don't know what else to do with time. And I can... I can sit around if I want. I got a nice place. Yeah, I got a record player. I can space out on the couch. But I, I would really miss being out there. It, it's going to be hard to walk away from it. So. You're still lifting. You still look good. Thank you. And uh, listen, I can't wait to August 10th. This has been one of the highlights of my seven-year podcast sir. career, just to sit across from somebody who was uh, no Hollywood, no bullshit. It, when you get up in the morning, your two feet hit the floor, you look up and you thank Buddha or somebody that he gave you another day for somebody to fucking rock. You know what I'm saying? Like, when no, I wake up. Absolutely. So thank you for A.J. Weston. Thank you for telling that kid, don't, don't talk to the fucking cops, cocksucker. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> August 10th, I'll be supporting you and everybody on this church that listens to this podcast. Thank you. We'll be supporting you for the words you said today, man. And you have an open door to come in here and I don't know. Whatever you have an open door here. Whenever you want to come. All right. And uh, Heidi, who takes care of you, is you're very lucky to have. Twenty two years she's been running the show. Very lucky to have her in your life. She's like my wife. I look at her without my wife, I'd be fucking ugats. I'd be a piece of shit. So uh, give her a hug for me, and uh, we'll all be watching okay. August tenth, brother. Thank you, and good luck with the tour. Oh, now once it ends the fifteenth, when do you restart? Because uh, on the website, on henryrollins.com, yeah. the tour only goes to 12-15. Oh, uh, the next big tour I'll do would be 2020. 2020. Yeah. So you'll take how much time off between 12-15 and the next tour? Oh, a, a year. couple of years. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, the next tour will be not a slideshow. It'll just be me, and it'll be the big one. I do it like every presidential election year. I do the big lap. I do, I do like Europe like three times, like festivals, on and on and on. The big month in Australia, so I do very well there. So I do multiple nights. Uh, that's that goes on and off for fourteen months. So it'll go from twenty 2020 twenty into twenty twenty one if all goes according to plan. I'm telling you what I'm going to do today, out of respect for you. For the last five years, I've had a guy been bothering me, He's a gentleman, Greg, and I have a lot of people, my agents. I'm going to get my passport. I'm calling the attorney. I'm giving. I'm paying the ten thousand dollar fine I have in Seattle for the warrant <laughs> for not going to. A, I got a ten thousand dollar fine. I got to pay. Seattle just wants the ten G's. I'd rather fucking get raped in the ass by ten little so, midgets with big dicks before I pay the ten G's. That's a lot of money for not going for fucking anger management classes. Okay, that's a lot of money. The guy attacked me at a comedy club, and then I got to do it. So I'm gonna pay the ten G's. I'm getting the passport. I'm gonna start traveling because I noticed a certain beauty you have. And it's because of your travel. It helps. It, it, it really will make you understand I'm America done. better. I'm done. I love America. You know, it's great. I came here. But you'll understand America. it better when you travel. More. I love South Dakota. I'm going to North Dakota next year. I, I it's love beautiful up there. Every spot of this country. But sitting here across from me for this last hour, 
I saw something in you that you got from traveling, from meeting that woman in Tehran. She's from, amazing. From meeting that Cuban man and talking baseball, baseball, hey, yeah. hey marijuana, no marijuana, hey, you know. So uh, I love you, brother. Thank, Thank you. you for inspiring me, and uh, you got me. I got your back to the end of fucking time. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, and send Heidi my love. I will. All right. I want to thank uh, Henry Rollins for doing a great job and coming in and fucking blessing us. I want to thank Lee. And I want to thank you guys. But most importantly, don't forget this Thursday night, Kansas City. Here I come, bitch. Full fucking house. Dean Delray's coming from the East Coast. We're fucking parachuting right into fucking Kansas City at the Improv. Thursday, 8 o'clock. That's the show to be at. Friday, Rogan's in town. So I gotta understand. I understand. I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at nobody. My feelings have been hurt before. I went to prison for four years. You understand? <laughs> but Saturday night, I'll see you then at the Kansas City Improv. Ready to eat some fucking ribs, farting the whole fucking deal. And then at the end of the month, Huntsville, Alabama, one night only Thursday. And then I take it straight up to Nashville the week before Memorial Day or uh, Labor Day weekend. The summer's almost over, motherfuckers. And I'm, I'll see you in September in D.C. at the 930 Club fucking uh, Parks Casino, and then we're at the Wilbur Theater, myself and Lee. There's like 30 tickets left for the second show, so you fucked out of luck. And we're also at Connecticut at the Foxwood. Foxwoods on, uh, but there's still tickets there, so do what you need to do. I love you guys. Have a great fucking Monday. Thank you for listening. Stay black. Have a great day.